Hi everyone, this is uh, Matt, the Game Explainer, and today we're going to be taking a look at a game called Expedition Northwest Passage. Uh, it's designed by um, Eves Trigny, if I pronounced that correctly. If I didn't, I apologize. Uh, and it was uh, produced by Matigo uh, Games. It's part of their select collection. Uh, as usual with Matigo Games, the presentation is phenomenal. The artwork is great. The components are great. Um, and I think the gameplay is really fantastic as well. But let me go ahead and go through the rules explanation, kind of show you how it works, and then you can decide if you think it's something you want to check out. So the game is for two to four players, and um, the box is about 60 minutes play time, but I think that's a bit uh, optimistic. It's probably more like 90 minutes. Uh, it can be even a little bit longer um, if you have uh, players that are prone to analysis paralysis. Um, it does support two to four players, and it does seem to play very well at all of those player levels. Uh, so what you see in front of you here is the board. It's not an overly large board, so it actually fits very nicely on you know even a smaller table. I've got it set up for a two-player game. Uh, we've got two player mats up there. I'll show you those um, zoomed in here in just a minute. Um, the only real change between uh, two, three, and four players is um, how many victory point chips you put um, both at the Northwest Passage end and um, at the Greenland end of the board. So I'll show you that in a minute as well. But basically the whole idea behind the game, um, it does kind of have a historical setting. Uh, back in 1845, Sir John Franklin from um, England was sent um, by the English Navy to uh, on an expedition to find the Northwest Passage. Uh, he took a couple of ships and he got as far as Greenland um, in the fall and uh, where he took off, um, you know, basically to try and find the remaining uh, portion of the Northwest Passage, and he was never seen from again. Uh, both ships were lost. And so, um, as players in this game, you're basically uh, following up in the next spring um, as, you know, players who are bo both setting out to, you know, find the Northwest Passage and basically succeed where Franklin failed, but also to try and find evidence um, as to what happened to, to the Franklin expedition. So, as you'll see, you know, when we kind of go through the game here, um, there's ways to score points both by finding the Northwest Passage, but also by uh, finding kind of evidence of the Franklin Expedition and other, you know, kind of uh, interesting uh, finds along the way. Okay, so basically the board is, is uh, broken into three zones. You see the kind of times one, times two, and times three zone. Uh, that will affect scoring uh, of discoveries as you go across the board. And then, of course, the board is um, going to be you know, explored. It's kind of one of those build the map as you go kind of games. Um, as you can see up here in the corner, let me go ahead and grab the camera. Um, up here in the corner, a portion of the, the map has been discovered. So you have the kind of the Greenland arrow where all the players start. And these are the, the ship tokens that come with the game. They're really, really nice. Um, so everybody starts you know, at Greenland on this big arrow. And then there are three kind of one by two tiles that are pre-printed on the board. So these are always there at the start of the game. And then there's a couple of points of interest. These are called cairns. Cairns are piles of rock that are made by man. Uh, they can often be uh, used as kind of wayfinder points, especially in a, you know, a barren terrain like the Arctic, where uh, it's very difficult to, you know, s you know, look for landmarks. So as you go through, you'll see, you know, some of those tiles come out where you have these, these rock piles, and you can collect those, um, these tokens here to score points during the game and also at the end of the game. Um, but so that's it. That's the start of the map. And then again, you know, players are going to then be able to uh, pull tiles from um, both this um, supply of four one by two tiles, as well as this supply here of one by one tiles. Uh, these tiles are um, you know, primarily made to fill in holes in the map as they get formed, but they can also be used strategically by players to help you know, uh, get the type of terrain out there that they're looking for. Um, anytime a player you know, takes one of these tiles, it immediately gets replaced from a supply, and that supply is in this bag here. It's really nice embossed bags, cloth, but it's really heavy duty and it holds a whole bunch of those one by two tiles that players will use to build out the map. Um, the other thing you'll notice on the board, we've got slots for, you know, kind of four player markers here. These are your little workers in the game, your crew members here. Um, 
So this will you know will randomly determine the starting player order at the start of the game, and then uh, basically the first player to pass on any given round will take their marker, move it down into this first position here, and then that player will be going first on the next round. And then of course the other player in a two-player game would then have to be second on the next round. So that's what this area of the board is used for. Um, finally, of course, you've got the score track, you know, here down around the board, the bottom of the board. Um, the other really, though, um, kind of novel component in this game is this two-colored marker right here. Okay, um, Basically, the game is going to be played over 10 rounds. And this marker is the round marker. So it's going to mark, you know, what round we're in. But it also is used to mark um, the seasons or the passing of the seasons. So, um, and it affects the map and how you can move around on the map qu uh, quite dramatically. So it's really an interesting uh, component and effect in the game. Basically, the way it works is, um, as you can see, you know, the board is divided into these horizontal rows. It's in a grid, right? And any row that is aligned with the yellow or below on the map, that area is considered to be unfrozen. Okay, so the blue areas here is water, right? And the white area is land. Now, like I said, any, any tiles that lie in this yellow area and below, the water is not frozen. And so ships can sail through that water. But anything that's up here in the blue area and above, that water is frozen. And so your ships cannot sail through the frozen water. All right, so what do you do, right? So what's going to happen is um, each round, you know, after players take all their actions for a round, then we move this marker over to the next position counterclockwise. And um, so that would be, for example, the summer position is now the entire map is below that marker, right? So all the water that's out here is going to not be frozen. So you can sail anywhere on the map. But if I can replace the camera here momentarily. Okay, let me get that adjusted here. Okay, so basically, as you move the marker around, as you can see, you go from summer, early fall, late fall, and finally winter down here at the bottom, right? And there's two winter locations, one over there and one over here. Now, when you're in the winter location, as you can see, only this bottom row on the map is unfrozen. Everything else up there is frozen. So as you can imagine, you know, as you're sailing your sailing ship around um, on the map, trying to explore and, you know, collect tokens and get points, eventually your ship is probably going to get stuck in the ice, right, in the frozen water, unless you happen to have worked to get it all the way down here onto the bottom. So eventually you're going to have to launch your sled. Now, every, so every player starts the game with a sled here. Let me see if I can make it easier to see that. Um, here. Okay, this is the sled token. Okay. Um, it's very cool. Again, these are kind of glued components. They come pre-glued in the game. Everybody has one of these sleds, and it starts on your ship. Now, at any time during the game that you want, you can launch your sled into the same onto the same tile that your ship is currently on. Now, your sled has different movement rules than your ship. Obviously, your ship can only sail through open water. Right? That's it. Now, your sled, however, can move across either land or frozen water. So, as you can see, as you know, the season progresses and more of the map becomes frozen, it may be advantageous to get your sled out and have it start going across the frozen landscape. But, eventually, what freezes must thaw. So, as the marker continues to move during the game, and we finish up winter, and we start moving into spring, right, it's going to go back to here, Eventually, it's going to go back up to the summer location again, and then the final round will be over here. Okay, so it kind of makes a complete circuit all the way around, back up to here, and then ends right over there. So you may launch your sled at some point during the game, but then eventually more and more of the water is going to start to thaw and be open water again. And obviously, if your sled somehow gets stuck down here in the southern regions as the map starts to thaw, your sled may be may may get stuck. It may be on an island and it can't cross any open water to get back to your ship. So one of the really neat aspects of this game is you're really managing two vessels at the same time, your ship and your sled, and 
You, you have to decide when do I want to launch the sled? Where do I want my ship to be when the, everything kind of freezes up? And how am I going to get my sled back to my ship? Or do I want to get back to my ship? Maybe I abandon my ship and just take everybody onto my sled and try and get my sled back to Greenland before the game ends. Because one of the things that happens in this game is, um, well, I didn't show that on the board here, but I'll, I'll just pick up the tiles. Over here on the Northwest Passage side, you can see that um, there's a couple of tiles here. They have points on them, like this one here, 10 point tile, okay? In a two player game, you have two tiles over here. One is 10 points and one is three. And the first player to get either their ship or their sled onto that Northwest Passage arrow, okay? So you have to kind of build the map all the way across and get onto that arrow, um, will get the 10 point tile. All right, so that's one of the ways to score points in the game is just kind of get over there before everybody else and get that big point tile. Uh, the second player in this case would only get three points if he gets over to the Northwest Passage as well. And then um, you have to try and get back to Greenland before the end of the game to avoid um, getting penalized some points. So not only when you come back to Greenland, the first player to come back is going to get points, in this case six points in a two-player game, and the second player in a two-player game gets zero points for getting back to Greenland. But the penalty for not getting back to Greenland is printed out here on your player board. So if this thing will focus, let me see if I can get it to focus. Hello, focus. Okay, well, it's not focusing real well, but um, down here it notes that um, if your ship does not make it back to Greenland by the end of the game, you're going to lose two points, okay? That's just your ship. Now, for every crew member that doesn't make it back to Greenland, you're also going to lose two points. So if, again, like I said, you um, have all your crewmen on your sled and your sled somehow gets stuck and you can't make it back to Greenland, you could lose a lot of points. Because in this game, everybody's going to have seven crew members on their ship at the start. These, these little guys, okay? And these crewmen are what you're going to use to trigger actions in the game. So, as you can probably see on this player board, there are two columns here. There's the ship column, okay, which has a top and a bottom, and there's the sled column, which has a top and a bottom. At the start of the game, all seven crew members are up here on the ship, and they're ready to do stuff. As you uh, take actions in the game, you're going to take a crew member, or two or three, however many you're spending for that action, and slide them down to the lower position. Anybody down here is resting, and they are unable to do any more actions for that round. So basically, you're going to spend your crew, you know, action after action, turn after turn, until you're, you've spent all your guys, or you're, you've done everything you want to do for the round. And then at that point, that's when you'll pass and move your player marker up there on, that, on the track. Once again, all players have spent all the guys they want to spend, and everybody's passed for the round. Then that's when we'll go to the next round, and you'll move the, the round marker. Okay, in this case, the, the round weather marker. So that's kind of the flow of the game. Everybody's taking, you know, turn after turn until all actions have been taken for the round, and then you move to the next round. So it flows very, very well. Um, so let me go ahead and explain what actions you can do in the game and a little bit more about kind of the how the turns flow. So first off, um, before I explain the actions, you'll see, again, these different markers, these symbols on the, on the board. This represents finding a straight, okay? So like a, a, a you know, a, a stretch of water between two bodies of land. Uh, an example of that would be like this tile right here, okay? If you can see this tile has that, that straight marker on it. You can see there's like a straight here between two bodies of land, okay? So that would be um, a straight. Uh, the next thing that you'll see here is kind of this canoe symbol. This represents finding evidence of the Franklin expedition, okay? Um, so, again, an example of that would be, like, on this tile. This tile here, you can see the canoe symbol there. It's looking at, like a little peninsula kind of thing. But that's uh, the Franklin expedition. Uh, the next symbol you'll see down here is, this is, represents um, cartography or finding islands. So, this is a really interesting part of the game, and I'll show you how it works in a minute. But... Basically, you know, as the map gets built out by players placing tiles on the board, they can actually form islands. And in this case, an island would have to be, you know, obviously a body of land that is completely surrounded by water and or the edge of the board. 
So once an island has been formed that, by a player by placing a tile, that player is going to score points based on how many tiles, not squares, but how many tiles it took to form the island, anywhere from one to four points, depending on, again, the number of tiles. And then they'll take one of these markers, um, like this, okay, one of these little cartography markers, and keep it, okay? And then the other two kind of markers you can find out on the map, one is the Inuit kind of native symbol. Um, let me show you an example of that. Okay, so you'll see you know, tiles here with like an Inuit on it. And then also, again, we talked about the, the rock piles, the cairns. You'll see those as well. So why do you want to collect these five, you know, types of tokens from the map? Well, they all score you points as you collect them. But then some of them, these three over on the left here, are also worth more victory points at the end of the game. And let me see if I can get that to focus in a little bit and show you how that works. So first off, let's talk about the, the, um, the straight symbols here. Uh, for each one of these that you collect, you're going to get either one, two, or three points at the time you collect the token. And that is going to be based on, again, what zone of the map you collected in. So if the symbol or the token was on the times one zone, you get one points, two points in this zone, three points in that, in that zone. The same thing um, is true for the Franklin Expeditions. You're going to get one, two, or three points based on the zone that you pick up the token in. Um, and then for the cartography, again, you have to form an island to get one of these tokens. Uh, and you'll score one, two, three, or four points. Now, at the end of the game, you can see there's a like a first, second, and third place points based on um, whichever player has the most of these tokens. They're going to score 11 points. Second place will get five. Third place will get two. Now, in the case of a tie, let's say there were two players tied for having the most straights tokens. They would share, uh, they would both score the second place points. So they basically reserve first and second place, but they both score second place points. In this case, five each. All right, so and that's the same way with the uh, Franklin tokens and the um, cartography or island tokens. They all have first, second, and third place at the end of the game. So that's kind of a neat, a neat thing. Um, these Inuits and these rock piles, um, they score either uh, two, four, or six points, again, depending on what zone of the map you pick up the token in. So these guys get you more points during the game, but there's no you know, individual end game points you know, strictly for these um, tokens. There is, however, a set collection mechanic in the game where it's kind of hard to see down here, but it shows all five of the tokens. And if you have a full set of all five, you get six points for that set. So there's an incentive to, you know, not maybe just focus exclusively on one type of token, but try and get a little bit of all of them so you can collect sets and get even more points at the end of the game. So that's basically how you're scoring points from discoveries, okay? Finding all of these things as you build out the map. And again, again we already talked about the point penalties of, you know, leaving your ship and leaving guys behind, not getting them back to Greenland. So that's, you know, going to affect your score potentially at the end of the game as well. And finally, we talked about getting points from the Northwest Passage and getting points for getting back to Greenland. So that's all of your points in the game. It's you know, getting across, getting back, and then doing all of these discoveries along the way. So that's how you get all your points. Um, now, in terms of the actions you can perform on your turn, they're all listed across the bottom of the board. The first one here, this, by the way, the, I, I can't get it to focus real well, but there's a number in this black circle. It represents how many crew members you have to spend to trigger this action. So on your turn, um, you have to do at least one action. That action can be to pass for the round. If, if you do pass, it has to be your first action for the round, and then you're out for that entire round. You're done, right? So you usually do that after you've spent all of your crew members, but sometimes you might want to get you know, earlier in the turn order, so you might pass early. That's up to you. But in any case, this first action is simply to take one of the tiles from the supply, either one of the four bigger ones or any one of the smaller ones. You take one tile, and you spend one crew member to do that, okay? And that crew member can be spent from either your ship or your sled, if you happen to have your sled out on the map as well. The second action is to take a tile, again, from the supply, but first to wipe all four of the big tiles away and replace them from the bag. So, again, if you don't have anything out there that's really, you know, nice and juicy for you and you want to maybe get something better, 
you, you can spend, in this case, two crew members to wipe the board of the four big ones and then put four new ones and pick, a, pick, pick any one tile. Again, you can still pick from the small tiles if nothing good comes out of the big tiles. Uh, the third action here is um, placing a tile onto the map. That costs one um, crew member. And in this case, because you're, this is called exploring, because you're exploring, you have to spend the crew member from the vessel that is doing the exploring. So, for example, you also have to be adjacent to the space that you're exploring. So, for example, again, both players start with their ships here at Greenland. And um, I would have to move out to this tile, for example, okay, before I could start placing new tiles out into the unexplored area. Once I've done that, once I've moved, then I can place a tile. Now, here's where uh, being able to kind of do the puzzle aspect of the game is very important. So I'm going to take the camera and zoom down in here and show you how that works. Obviously, all of the tiles have a combination of land and water on the edges. So by looking at the edges, you can really start to get a good feel for how you can place tiles. So for example, let's say I had this tile here and I wanted to place it. Okay, I must always match land to land and water to water. So for example, I could not place this tile down here because even though I've got land to land, here I've got land to water. That's illegal. All right, it works over here and over here, but not here. I also obviously could not place it like that because that's land to water. I could, however, place it like that. I could do water to water, right? Or I could do something, well, I can't do that because here I've got, you know, again, water to land, right? So you really have to look to see what tiles are going to work for you and how can you place them, right? Uh, again, if I had like this tile here, um, Let's see, I can't do it like that. By the way, you can flip the tiles over. They have a mirror image on the back side. So sometimes flipping them over will help to place them as well. Uh, I could place this one like this up here, okay, because I'm on this tile. I can place adjacent anywhere that's touching my tile, not diagonal. You can never place tiles like this. There's no diagonals in the game. Okay, that's illegal. You can also not move diagonally. Everything's kind of orthogonal here. But um, I could place this like that, okay? And, you know, that would actually, let's see, yep, yeah, that would actually, if I did that, that would actually help me to build an island. Because if you can kind of see here, let me zoom in a little more, you can see I've got a complete island right here. It's completely surrounded by water. And so by me coming out here and then placing this here, not only do I get one of these straight symbols out, and anytime you put a token out that has, or sorry, a tile that would have a token on it, immediately place that token out there okay I haven't got that token yet somebody in order to get it you have to move on to the tile that has the token and then spend an action to get that token so sometimes it's really neat you can place a tile but then another player might move out and get that token before you can so there's a really neat uh, interaction in this game in that in that sense but anyway going back to the placement rules by me placing this here I've formed an island that island consists of one, two, three tiles, and therefore I have formed uh, an island. Let's see if I can look down here. I formed an island with three tiles, and if it's got two or three tiles, it's going to get me one point. So I would immediately score a point, and I would get one of these cool cartography tokens here. Okay, and that would I would just put kind of put that down here on my board, and that would help me, you know, eventually score points towards at the end of the game. So that's kind of the whole idea of placement. So it's kind of a puzzle thing. You've got to put land to land, water to water, and just build out the map as you go. Okay? Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, put this back up here. Okay. All right. So now, let me go ahead and continue explaining the actions. All right, so that's placing a tile on the, on the map. Uh, next one is moving one of your vessels, so either your ship or your sled. That costs one guy, and again, you must, if you're moving your ship, you have to spend a guy from your ship. If you're moving your sled, spend a guy from the sled, okay? So how do you get your crew split? Well, that's the next action here. It costs one guy to either launch your sled or pick up your sled. And the way that works, again, if my guy here is on this tile and I want to launch my sled, then I would spend one crew for my ship, 
I would put my sled out onto that tile. Now again, I have to be able to place it legally on that tile. So if that tile, for example, right now has liquid water, I'd have to place it on uh, a land portion of that tile. And if it was an all water token, then obviously I could not place my sled there because you can't put your sled in open water. But in this case, I could put my sled on the land there. It's kind of behind the ship, if you can see it, okay? And when I do that, then what I want to do is I'm going to transfer guys between, you know, from my ship over to my sled. And let me kind of show that up here on one of these other boards. So, you know, if, if it was, you know, if I was spending an action to, to move guys to my sled and launch my sled, then I, you know, I have to decide how many guys do I leave on my ship and how many do I move to my sled? In this case, maybe I want to move like four guys over to my sled and leave these three guys on my ship. Okay, I could do that. So now going forward, I can you know do actions with my ship and my sled, you know depending on what I want to do. You can always move everybody over if you want. I could put everybody on my sled and just leave my ship where it is. But then again, if if later in the game, if I'm you know moving way out here and my sled gets stuck on an island and it's surrounded by open water, my ship's way back here. I got nobody on my ship, then there's no way for me to move my ship over to pick up the guys on my sled. That would be really disastrous. And if you're not careful, that's something you can really do, especially the first time you play the game. So you don't want to kind of screw yourself over. Um, you really have to think about managing how am I going to move my ship around and how am I going to move my sled? And therefore, how do I want to split my crew? Okay, so that's an, a big part of the strategy in this game is, is managing both of your, your vessels and the crew on them. Okay, so that's um, launching and picking up your sled. And, and of course, then to pick up your sled later in the game, your ship and your sled have to be on the same tile. And then you can do this action to pick up your sled, put it back on your ship, and move all of your crew back to your ship. Um, finally, we have a couple of actions here for picking up tokens from the board. So this is how you're going to get these tokens and score points with them, both during and at, and at the end of the game. It costs three guys to pick up either a Franklin or a Straits token. So these are very expensive, but also, again, they're very valuable, right? They score you points, you know, they can get you big points at the end of the game. Um, for the um, Inuit and Cairn tokens, you know, again, um, they only cost two guys to pick up. But that's because, again, they, can, they, they score a little more points during the game, but then at the end of the game, they only give you points for scoring sets. Um, so that's all of the actions you can do, you know, on your turn. Now, one really important thing to note is on your turn, like I said, you must perform a minimum of one action. But you can do more than one action on your turn if you think it's advantageous for you. However, each action that you perform beyond the first action costs one more guy than usual. So, for example, if I wanted to both pick up and place a tile on the same turn, it would cost me you know, one guy to pick up the tile, right, because that's my first action. And then normally to place a tile, it would cost me one guy. But because I'm doing it as a second or subsequent action, it cost me one extra. In this case, it would cost me two guys. So one for the first action plus two for the second action, it would cost me a total of three guys to do those two actions on my same turn, okay? But again, sometimes that can be very advantageous because maybe I want to move, right, over to here and pick up that token on the same turn. So I get it before anybody else can swoop in and take it from me. Um, so there's a lot of strategy there in, ter in terms of maybe spending extra guys, right, and kind of doing extra actions on your turn um to, to get an advantage but basically that's that's really the whole crux of the game um there's also one other little rule that you know players cannot build out the map such that there is no possible water path between greenland and the northwest passage so you can't just like build this giant land block out here somewhere that would prevent a ship from sailing across okay that's just one little rule that is easy to forget um other than that, I think that's pretty much it. Um, you know, the rule set is pretty simple, uh, as you can see, but um, it is a really highly strategic game. Um, does require a lot of thinking to really try and optimize your turns and optimize your score um, to not screw yourself by, you know, splitting up your, uh, your ship and your sled uh, such that they can't get back together at some point. Um, and that's it. I've had a lot of fun with the game so far. If that looks interesting to you, uh, go ahead and check it out. And as always, thanks for watching.